Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear, gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be here this morning. We're thankful for the way that you have worked in our lives, the things that you have been teaching us, the trials that we have faced, and your providence in leading us along this journey. We just ask for your spirit to be here. It can speak to us and teach us and guide us. We ask, Lord, that we can have an understanding of your word, that we can see the things that you wish to show us that are needful. And we pray for one another, that uh, your angels can watch over each person and that um, you can strengthen us through your spirit and by your word. Be with us in this study, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. And um, so uh, this this series that we're doing, and do I have too much light on me? Is it okay, Iran? Should I turn off the other light? Seems okay. Okay, I'll leave it on. Usually I just have one light on. So in this series, what we're doing is a continuation of the study that we did on understanding the lines where we had finished with the book of Judges. We then did a camp meeting where we went through the book of Judges, everything we had learned in uh, in that series, which had gone on for well, well over a year. And um, and then uh, and then we took a, a break from that understanding the lines by going through uh, Daniel's last vision at the request of Colin. And so now we're back to understanding the lines. And we did a, a brief review yesterday of just the structure that we're looking at. Now, as far as the, the in the cosmic line, we've been studying literal Israel, uh, but within the line itself in literal Israel, we're actually studying uh, what originally I had in my charge, I just put like 1097 BC, which was the anointing of Saul. So we're actually leading up to uh, the kingdom of Israel, but this is the precursor. So you have, I, I, well, we have Eli as a judge. Uh, how do we classify Samuel? Is he, he's a judge as well, right? Yes. Or is he, or is he just a prophet, right? No. He is a prophet, but, but he's also judging Israel, right? Correct. And now, particularly, what does what does the judge it, it mean that he's a judge? Because sometimes they're deliverers, right? They deliver them from from oppression. With Samuel is still a little bit different. Um, at least I think think so. He's so we, we'll probably find out more as we we go through this. But it's going to lead to them having a king. So so who's the first king of Israel? Abimelech. Okay, Abimelech, right? So, so we had Abimelech being king, but he was not approved by God in any stretch of the imagination, right? And, and so we, we need to keep that in mind when they ask for a king and they're going to get Saul as a king. So there's lots of, lots of parallels that, uh, as I've been reading through this, and hopefully people have at least read 1 Samuel chapter 1, which we're going to read, but, uh, yeah, as as I read through this, there's some some very interesting things that we're going to have to discuss. So I know we're not going to move very fast, <laughs> but I do think we should at least read the chapter here. So um, it says now there was a certain man of Ramath Am Zophim, Ramath Am Zophim, uh, of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, or yeah, Jer Jeroram, I put an extra H in there, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zeph, an Ephrathite. So he's a descendant of Ephraim. And he had two wives, and the name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penaniah. And Penaniah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. So we know that the ark, so the ark, when they should just kind of remind us about this 
why is he going to Shiloh? So when they had crossed into the promised land, when they had crossed the Jordan River in uh, 1493 BC, they crossed the Jordan River. And where was, and they set up the ark there. Where, where did they set up the ark? Or the, the tabernacle, I guess, where the ark was, the tabernacle. I think it was originally in Gilgal. Yeah, so they, they had it in Gilgal, right? And then, and when is it going to move from Gilgal? How is it going to get to Shiloh? So what's what's going to happen there? I think they we... take the land first. So they oh. so they take the land first. So that's going to take a bit of time. So do we know, the, so the, the exact year you have it is six years after they cross the Jordan that they move it to Shiloh? Is that when it's moved? Uh, that would be my understanding. Okay, yeah. Now, um, I think the Jews tend to call it seven years, but I think they're doing an inclusive count. But I think they like the number seven there, is my understanding. So when we look at it, we see it as six years, but they, they do this inclusive count. So it's it's parts of seven years. Um, but, but basically six years later, it's going to move from Gilgal to Shiloh. And then it stays in Shiloh for how long? For 300 years. Yeah, so 300 years. Now, we don't get that directly from the Bible, right? There is a 300-year period that's going to be mentioned in the book of Judges. And um, that 300-year period is marking what? So in Judges, when it talks about the period of 300 years? Yeah, so it begins when they take the cities of Heshbon and ARR in the territory, I think it's... Of East of the Jordan? Uh, East the of the cities, Jordan. Yes, of the Amorites, of uh, Sihon, king of the Amorites. So that would be one year before they entered the land. You can maybe right. say it's maybe a bit less than one year, but I would say yeah, maybe early... It, it's in the first year that they enter the land. Well, it depends. Yeah, that's going to be before they cross the Jordan, you're saying. Yeah, so I would say maybe certainly a few months anyway, but maybe about four or five months before they cross the land into the into Canaan. Right, and that's, that's just in Judges 11.26. While Israel dwelt in Heshbon and her towns and in Aurora and her towns and in all the cities that belong by the coast of Arnon, 300 years, why therefore did you not recover them within that time, right? So, um, uh, so there's 300 years, and this is uh, Jephthah. And Jephthah, what was the significance of Jephthah? Who's Jephthah? He's one of the judges, but who is he? Do we remember anything? Yeah, so he, he was um, sort of rejected from his household. He was the son of a concubine or yeah. a harlot or something. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and, and we, we're, I'm not going to go through and, and review all these judges, but um, he symbolizes what, how did, what did we have him symbolize? Is he like the cast out of Israel? The outcast yeah. Cast of Israel. Yeah, and so, so he he symbolized what in in our history. So we had the line of the judges, and we had, um, you know, the different judges different represented different way marks in our reform line, going from uh, nine eleven to January eleventh, twenty twenty three. Right. So the symboling symbolizing things within our movement. And it it represented in that line, the line of the judges, December 6, 2020, right? And so the outcasts are who? Who was outcast on December 6, 2020 from the movement? Well, right. that was yourself and quite a few others. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, and so we were kicked out of the movement. We were, the, you know, the movement uh, uh, considered us persona non grata. So, um, so that's what we mark as a way mark. And um, so, so Jephthah is in that in that line. He's the the formalization of the second angel's message. The second angel's message is the Ju July 18, 2020 date. And then after 777 days, we have the empowerment, which is Ibzan, Elam, and Abdon. Right then, we had Samson representing uh, 
the failed prediction there of uh, Collins. Colin made that prediction regarding Trump. And then uh, we had Samson and Delilah, which represents a, a symbolic date in the future, not a liter not a date that we look for anything. So we don't do any time setting, any predicting of events, but we do analyze symbols, right? So, so when we look at, at these stories and we look at these symbols, uh, the 300 years also has symbolism to it, which we're going to address uh, further as we go along. So if I go back here, so we have that 300. Now, the 300 years that we have that the Ark was in Shiloh, we get that from the spirit of prophecy. So when you work that out, Stephen, so the, the question was when, when Ellen White says 300 years the Ark was in Shiloh, the question is, do we take that as, as an exact number? And even the 300 years in, in Judges 11.26, um, some people just say, well, maybe it's just a round number. You know, because what's the chances that, you know, when he's going to mention it, he's going to mention it at the time that it's actually now 300 years. Right. That's that's sort of the argument that people would have against some of the spans of time. Now, 300 is, is sort of a number that could be a round number. Right. But, you know, if you have a number like First Kings uh, chapter one, verse or First Kings chapter six, verse one, where it talks about 480 years. You know, people sometimes even try to say those are just, you know, guesses or round numbers. Uh, but we've worked out this chronology and um, the 300 years, both the one that Ellen White gives and the one that's given uh, in the scriptures. We can have them work out that they they make sense within the time allotted for the period of the judges. That is, in First Kings chapter six, verse one, it tells us that the foundation of Solomon's temple was laid in the 480th year since the children of Israel uh, came, um, had uh, gone out of the land of Egypt, which is referring to the time they crossed the Jordan, not when they initially left, right? So we worked out that chronology and, and it fits, right? Now, there are still some loose threads in that chronology, right? Stephen, things that we're uncertain about? Yeah, tying in when... Psalms from Kazan and when Ibsam and stuff, it was kind of uh, tying in all the chronologies with the 18 years of persecution with Ammon and the Philistines and stuff. It's yeah. sort of, um, it's, 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 it's a difficult, I can't really make it all fit nicely. Yeah, there isn't enough sort of information. Long way and, and, yeah, there's not enough information given in scriptures to work out some of the detail, right? Yes. But is there any contradictions? I would any... think it. Um, I don't know about contradictions, but from what I was looking at, you would have to say that at least one of them 300-year periods would be approximate. Okay, so one would be approximate. Now, yeah, you know, I tend to take the position that Ellen White's 300 years is approximate. And, and the reason why I say that is I think she's taking the 300 years from Judges 11, verse 26. And she's recognizing that that's sort of an overlapping period. And that gives her some guideline to say 300 years. Does that make sense to people? Well, you could say that's a possibility. Yeah, that, it's a possibility. And we know she does use some round numbers. Uh, she talks about the dedication of the second temple, you know, the temple being completed in, well, 516, 515. BC and she says that's 500 years before I think she has before Jesus is born which of course uh, one person tried to argue with me that uh, that meant Jesus was born in 15 BC or something like that um, I think they had they had the temple completed in 520 so they had 20 BC and you know I'm like no it's just a round figure and sometimes she'll talk about something as 500 years and, and generally, she tends to round down rather than rounding up when she uses these sort of spans of time. But she's very consistent in her chronology and um, uh, a lot of details in her chronology, even though she uses spans of times and not dates. When you put them together like a pieces of a puzzle, they all fit with the chronology that we have in scriptures and that we had worked out.
Okay, so so that's some of some of the chronology here. We have um, this time period. Now, you have, we we showed yesterday just you know where you put him as being born. Some of this is it, it's just the best guess, right? Based upon a yes. few assumptions, but. So it's those, some of those aren't aren't set in stone. Now, did you find uh, structures with some of these things that were symbolically uh, significant? Like some of our dates, we have all kinds of structures that show uh, a design that that they couldn't have occurred by chance. We don't really have that with like the birth of Samuel per se, right? Not that I can remember with Samuel. Yeah. There were some structures I put together mm -hmm. table of history uh, they are included there, but concerning Samuel, I'm not sure. And there there was even some symbolism, even when we, we didn't take the literal time, but we just took the dates and added them up, like the years and added them up. There were structures in there, even though we recognize that some of these spans of times overlap, right? I don't remember all the details. The point being is that when we deal with the chronology itself, we never determine the chronology based on some symbolic thing that we see. We determine the chronology based upon objective facts, right? That's how we do it. And you understand why this is important. So when I was researching chronology in detail, you know, back about uh, 12 years ago, I read a lot of different chronologies and systems that people had on biblical chronology. And what people would do is decide that there was some kind of symbolic pattern, all kinds of different things, jubilee cycles, sabbatical cycles, other types of cycles that they imagined. And they forced everything to fit uh, their theory and ignored any objective facts that didn't fit their theory. Right. So the one thing that we always do is anything that we do has to match re reality. Right. Doesn't mean that that sometimes numbers can be given in the Bible, like adding all of the, the judges together and seeing that there's a structure there. Um, even if we took them as all consecutive, even though we know that some of them are contemporary, we wouldn't we wouldn't force a chronology upon that symbolic structure. Right. If we and and why is that important? I mean, it's kind of an obvious answer, but why, why is it important that we don't we don't use symbols to to create a chronology? We use them after the fact. Why, why is that important? Would it be as meaningful if we we just had some theory and now we fit everything into it? Yeah, Isn't I think uh, we, we just take what's given and try to work with what we can with what, what's there. Yeah. And uh, we can maybe see things. Once, once we sort of uh, analyze it, and yeah. uh, we can maybe then discover objective things. You know, whether it's not us putting our own impression or mindset or idea, theory, whatever, onto it. Yeah. It's just letting it speak for itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so we're, we're going to go through and continue reading this. I want to get through this, this um, uh, chapter, at least reading it. Okay, so we had, um, so we're verse three. This man went up out of his city yearly to worship and sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. So that's where the ark is. That's where the tabernacle is. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penaniah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore, that is, uh, Hananiah, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And so he did so, and as he did so year by year, when he went up to the house of the Lord, she so, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah unto her husband, then said Elkanah, her husband, unto her, Why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. 
And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me, not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now, Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, how, how long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Beliah, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Therefore it came to pass, when the time was come, about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, do what seemest, do what seemest thee good, tarry, until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine, and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my peti petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Okay, so there is lots in here that we should notice uh, right away that is... Uh, tied to symbols that we already have for a line. But we're going to go through this uh, slowly. And anything that uh, that we notice just in passing that jumped out at people? What about the names? Yeah, okay. So we're going to look at the names. So we will look at those things. But, you know, we see things like she's going to tarry, right? So the tarrying is a way mark in a line, right? So, you know, that's the point is do we see things here that that would be symbols that uh, we see in other lines and in and, and the main line, the template that we have of Millerite history. So I, I saw a number of different things, some different symbols. So that's one that jumped out at me right away, this tarrying. Um, with the weaning, I just had a, a thought concerning Isaac. Yeah, I, I was going to comment so on we that. Know, yeah. Yeah, so he was weaned. We understand when he was five years old. Yeah. So we don't know whether Samuel was weaned the same period of time, but uh, I don't know, possibility. Maybe yeah. we could bring in that five-year symbol there. Yeah, we could have a five-year symbol there. We, we we do have an example, one other place where weaning is three years. Now, the idea of weaning when we think of weaning is a little bit different in that culture. So once a child is weaned, it's, it's when the child can leave the mother, right? So it's not necessarily always connected to nursing per se, right? It's, it's sort of a, you know, it's partly connected to that, but it's, it's not solely connected to that. And we saw that with Isaac, that his weaning was probably longer than usual, I would think, because 
Sarah had no other, um, I don't think she was expecting to get another child again. It was her only child. And uh, uh, she wanted to spend as much time with him as she could. So that's sort of the idea there. But there are people who were arguing uh, that, you know, we, he couldn't have possibly be weaned at five years old. That's way too old. But it, it is, it, there is attached to it other ideas, not just nursing. So, um, and, and we know that when Isaac is weaned, for instance, there is a party that's given, right? So they celebrate his weaning. So it is, it is connected to uh, a major waymark in his life. We generally don't have parties when children are weaned. You know that I've never heard of one. So, <clears throat> so, so there's so there are some things here that we're going to take note of as we go through it. Um, but we can see that there is in in these stories there are are common threads that we see in other stories. And and we talked yesterday a little bit about a child. Like so, we know that when Eve had her first son, uh, Cain, you know after they had sinned and it was they were given the promised seed and when Cain was born you know God had given her a man child right so she was looking at Cain as the seed now in this case of course you know we're not going to see Samuel being uh, uh, part of the line of Christ or anything but there still is always this this idea within Jewish culture that maybe you know, that your child could be the promised Messiah, right? Or that he's going to be, uh, you know, that it's going to come through that line, right? So having a man-child is, is, is important in that context because of the promised seed. So, so there are things here that we can still look at as symbols and, and to see what that would mean. We also have, you know, uh, symbols of things being shut up like her womb being shut up things and and then being opened right so we'll we'll see where some of these symbols lead us in putting these things on a line okay so anybody else on any thoughts of what we've read so far i know dwight's always interested in the names and the symbolic meanings of the names so we know in scripture of course that names uh are are meaningful you know often we have names like some of the times we know the meanings of our names sometimes we don't um like stephen means a crown uh, jacob means supplanter i don't know what everyone else's name means obviously samuel means what the sam samuel you know what samuel means we got samuel here is it uh, god has heard yeah god has heard yeah Okay, so um, I, I know that it means I asked him. To... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you can see that the God part is the L, right? But you know, some of us, you know, we have names that, uh, um, you know, you have to look up on the internet to find. But biblical names usually usually can figure it out if you know any biblical Hebrew. I gave all my children biblical names, so I know what they all meant before I named them, though they have some middle names that aren't biblical names, but I also know what they mean. So we're going to have, um, so we have Elkanah, a Levite, he has two wives. Now, what's the significance of of here? So I'm going to scroll down here. There we go. So, okay, first we'll just deal with these names here. So Remathaim Zophim. What is what is that name? Well, from what I had looked up on that, this could be the same place as Arimathea. Yeah, that's what I understand. So Joseph of Arimathea, that's um, the tomb that Christ was his tomb, right? Right. Christ is going to be placed in. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, um, so when you look at the ending there, Ramathaim, that's a dual plural, right? So it, it's like a double city, right? You can see it's from the dual H7 or H7413. So that's the Strong's number. So if we go here, I'm just going to. Okay. So um, and 
the plural of the adjective participle, 6822. So Rama, which means the height. So it's the height. And then Safa, to lean forward, that is to peer in the distance. So the way that they have here, as you can see, the double height of watchers, right? That's that's how they have it here. So it's a dual, double height of watchers. So what would that what, what would that mean symbolically? Sophie being watchers. Would this have something to do with the second angel's message if it's a doubling? Okay, so maybe, yeah. So maybe there's something dealing with the second angel's message. Um, and I'm just looking up the word watcher. So, so what I'm doing, you know, as I go into my uh, King James concordance, so I look up the Hebrew word, safaf, safaf, and it occurs 38 times in the King James. It's translated as watchman 14 times. Uh, you see that in Second Samuel, Second Kings, uh, Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter three and chapter thirty-three. Now, so with Ezekiel, Ezekiel is also uh, the second angel's message, right? And why do we say Ezekiel is the second angel's message? The primary reason. Well, a lot of the dates, for instance, the first day of the first month is mentioned. The fifth day of the fourth month begins the. Uh, the book. Yeah, so he starts on the fifth day of the fourth month, and that's that's the second angel arriving in Millerite history. And it's also July 21st in both years, in 592 and in 1844. So, you can also say the second angel arrived on the first day of the first month. Yes, right. Oh, yeah, the second angel arrives on the first day of the first month. Correct. It, it's it's the, the well, formalized. That's the fifth of the day. Month. It's the midpoint. It's the mid. It's midnight. Yeah. It's the midpoint. So yeah, it's the midpoint. Yeah, yeah. I'm 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 trying to sort this all out really quick. So we got the first day of the first month. He has he has all of the dates in Millerite history of the second angel's message, and he's proclaiming Samuel Snow's message. So his message is the midnight cry, not just the second angel's message. Right? It is the mid. Uh, right? He gives at midnight. He's going to give this message. So. Now, we parallel that message, the first day of the first month, and all, all of that history of Samuel Snow's proclamation about October 22nd, 1844. How do we parallel that in our history? Where do we mark that? We mark it at 9-11, correct? Agreed. Correct. Agreed. And, and, and we know that this movement, even though you know it, it begins in 1989 with the fall of the Soviet Union, we recognize that this movement is about the second angel's message, which arrives at 9-11. And so everything that we have done in studying is understanding how history is unfolding with those two events. What happened with the fall of the Soviet Union, which is going to be the arrival of the first angel's message, parallels that in Millerite history, and then 9-11, the arrival of the second angel. And so our history is is understanding what, what this movement has gone through, is understanding of 9-11 and its relationship to Millerite history. So there are two primary things, the understanding of, of the past and how and then how it relates to the present. And, and of course, we don't do that just for a curiosity curiosity's sake. So we don't believe that just knowing what's going to happen in the future somehow is going to make us saved, so to speak. But we understand that um, that God is is preparing us to give a message to the world, and also preparing us individually for what's going, what's coming upon the earth, right? So, and He's preparing people all over the world in different ways, in different means, but basically through the study of His Word. Not everybody's studying all the same things we are, but they're coming to the same understanding of the truth. So. 9-11 is this waymark, which we aren't the only ones who, who recognize this waymark. Okay, so we have these watchers. So it's a double height of watchers. It has that symbol of double, which we apply to the second angel's message. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Okay. So the double height of watchers, a place in Palestine, probably the place of Arimathea. 
Now we have then the different names that are going to be connected to Elkanah. So Elkanah, he has, um, God has obtained, it according to what Dwight has here. And I'm just going to look at this myself. It could also be obtained of God. Okay, yeah. Yeah. God has possessed or God has created is what I have in uh, Brown's Drivers Briggs lexicon or dictionary. So it comes from obviously L being God and in um, uh, Kana means to erect, that is to create by implication to own, right? Because if you create something or purchase something or procure something, so it has quite a different, few different ways that it's, um, that that word, the root word there, Kana is translated. But, um, so we have that name, God has, con uh, has obtained or God has created. Now, Jeroham, Jeroham, it's got the het for the CH sound, uh, means compassionate and um, comes from 7355. So this is compassion, right? So it's, so it's compassionate. Um, so it's lots of different ways it's translated. Okay. Elihu, we know that that's also the name of one of Job's friends. God of him, that is, or his God. And tohu means depress or abasement. And zuf, honeycomb. Now, what's the significance of honeycomb? So we have something here pointing back to this with Samson, but also with honey, so that the eyes are enlightened. Right. So we know that, um, you know, we have, uh, I mean, the first thing I think about is the manna. It tastes like wafers made with honey when they, they taste it. So it's bread from heaven, right? And it becomes a symbol. We know that uh, Jonathan, when he's, um, there's this, they were supposed to take a vow that they weren't going to eat anything, but he, he's hungry and he eats some honey. And uh, his eyes are enlightened. And we also know the eating of the little book. You know, the eating of God's word is sweet in our mouth as honey, but it could be bitter in our belly, right? In part of that experience. So, so it represents to a dis represents a disappointment. Um, and then we got Ephraimite. Well, Ephraim means fruitful, right? That's um, the largest of the tribes in northern Israel, and of course, one of the sons of Joseph, that he was enlarged. So that's part of uh, Joseph's blessing, right? So, and and sometimes uh, Ephraim is just called Joseph, the tribe of Joseph. Okay. Um, so what do these names then mean? What do we do with these names? So we have these names. They're symbols. How do we apply them? Do we have enough information to apply any of this? We, we've already done that with Ram, Ra, Ramathayim, Zophim. Any thoughts? Is there a structure we can make of this? Um, well, what would we have at this point to make it a structure? I'm trying to put this together like we did the names of the first 10 patriarchs from Adam down to Noah. Yeah, so to put them into a sentence? Right. Is that what you're saying? Okay. I, I wouldn't know how to, to do this because I don't see any – because I'm not sure, you know, what, what the story is yet. Right, but we might be able to find something as we go through here. Okay, we also have some other names here as well, so that might help us a bit. So we have um, these two two wives. Now, what's the significance of a woman in Scripture? Church. Okay, so we have a church. So could this be showing church and movement? Okay, well, it's possible, right? So we have one church that is barren and the other one that uh, is an adversary, right? Right. Okay, so any other thoughts on that? Well, 
Okay, Hannah, which of course is a name that, that's the same no matter how you spell it. Yeah, it's a, uh, what they call that, a palindrome? Correct. So, so it's a mirror. here you have... It's another way to say it's a mirror, right? Correct, mirror. But you also, you, you have one that is favored. Yeah. And then... And I, you have a question mark. Exactly. Correct. And I, uh, I looked it up, but I don't, you know, I, I don't yeah. have anything that I was able to find, like in Brown Driver Briggs or any of the others. That, yeah, well, they just say a jewel or probably a pearl is in Strong's as round, and it's translated someplace as a ruby in the King James. Sometimes precious stone. Okay, so, but Hannah is favored. I wanted to name my daughter Diana. I wanted to name, name her Hannah. Levine wanted Anna. And I, I wanted Hannah. I wanted the H's at the beginning. Then. So we ended up with Diana instead of Hannah or Anna. <laughs> but anyway, Penina, Pen, Penina, I guess is how it would be pronounced. So so we have two, two women, two wives. So what would be the significance here as far as what we've seen so far in these first two verses? So do we have no, another symbol of the second angel's message? How? Oh. How well, just it's a doubling. There's two wives. It's a doubling. Okay. Um, but we also see two classes. Definitely that. Yeah, so we see these two classes um, being represented. Now, um, so now you're, you've been sort of suggesting that maybe one represents the movement, one represents the church. Right. I mean, it could be that it just represents what occurs within the movement itself. And that's right. also a possibility. So it's it's just a separation of two different classes. One that's that, and we saw that when we talked about Jephthah, you know, being an outcast. So you know, one of the characteristics that that is rather interesting as we look in Scripture is we see that there, um, the God is not always, even though the the firstborn is supposed to get the the inheritance, right? But we see that God often it's going to be not the firstborn, right? The God chooses those that are lowly. He chooses those that are not seen by the world standard as the ones that should be favored, right? Now, why does God cho 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 choose those that are not uh, the great men of the world, not many great, not many wise, not many mighty men? Why does God do that? What is he illustrating? Character development. Okay. So, well, obviously he's, he's, he's transforming human beings, right? right. So, but, but what is he showing his power over, over sin, right? He's, he's not, he's, he's taking the weak things of the world to confound the wise. So he, he goes to the shepherds, you know, when Christ is born with the angels to give the good news. You know, shepherds out in their field, not not to the kings, not to the mighty men to announce Christ's coming. And Christ, of course, you know, he's born in a manger, right? You know, God has this way of working um, that uh, uh, we've talked about lots. But basically, you know, he takes those that he is able to use and often people who have, are very talented. Uh, he sometimes cannot use, and and there are two reasons, and we're going to see this when we get to Saul. Even though Saul appears humble at first, uh, it's going to go to his head once he's made king, right? And that's a great danger to be to put someone in that position of saying, "Well, this is you know God's God's messenger, God's leader, God's prophet, whatever people want to do." When you put somebody. You know, you say, oh, this is a great pastor. You know, he's a godly man, and you praise him. Uh, it's definitely not productive. It's not, you know, because anything that we have comes from God, right? So if somebody's a great teacher um, and you you hold him up in, in honor in a place that he shouldn't have, and everybody sort of bows to his every word, that's a dangerous position for a person to be in, right? Nobody wants to be in that position. At least we shouldn't want to. Right? But also Ellen White says that 
when we do that, God removes the wisdom that he has given that person. And, and we've seen that happen to people, right? Sometimes God leads an individual and he uses him and then things get out of hand. That person thinks of himself more highly than he ought to. And, um, and then he goes off course. Now, God, of course, sometimes has chosen people that he's put in the place like Moses. He didn't go to Moses' head, though he did, you know, hit the rock, uh, with his staff twice, you know, instead of speaking to it. So any other thoughts on this? Not these, quite. these two lives. Okay. So, you know, we'll obviously see more as we go through this story. And this man, um, so this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord were there. Now, um, we have more names too, right? So we have Eli, which means lofty. Hophni, you have here pugilist. Right. Um, with a question mark. When you look at the Hebrew number. 2652. Right. Yeah, so it might mean a fist or um, two fists. So that's why they get the idea that maybe it's pugilist. And, and Phinehas, I'm not sure why you would name somebody the mouth of a serpent. Um, that was an interesting choice. I'll give you that. Yeah. Yeah, and there's three people with that name. But, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't have named any of my kids Phinehas. Now, so these these are, of course, priests. So so these are, are definitely descendants of Levi, right? So these are Levites, priests. Now, he's going to go up yearly to worship right now the hebrew uh says from year to year right so as you can see that in the uh alternate uh translation that the 1769 king james translators give this man went up out of his city from year to year and that's just a hebrew idiot so it means like every year I don't know if it only means once a year or that he he goes at at all the times that re required, both in the spring and the fall. It's hard to know. So I don't know if it means annually or or just that he does all of the pilgrimages, the two pilgrimages, one in the spring, one in the fall. But we do we do have another symbol of a double, right, year to year. Now we already addressed the idea of Shiloh, where where the the sanctuary is, and the ark, as we know, the ark is going to uh, have a little bit of a journey in this history, being removed from Shiloh. But at this point, we just we know that he's. This is when the ark is still in Shiloh. That the sanctuary is still there. Now we're we're going to look at a lot more things. We're going to go over these verses again. We're just trying to get the basic ideas here. Okay, so we have basically this is the introduction. These three verses uh, give us the characters that are involved in this story at this point. We also have another doubling with the two sons. Now, why, why is this doubling important? Like, when do we first see doublings happening in Scripture? Do we it, think what first doubling is? Okay, go on, Dwight. Is it possible with this doubling with the two sons that we're being given a warning message? Okay, well, yeah, I think I think that, that there is. But when, when we think about when this doubling happens, a doubling occurs the first time. Like we could say, well, Jacob and Esau, twins, that's a doubling, right? But we see in that whole story of the lines dealing with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that there are events that double themselves. And there's lots of doublings, you know, double dreams, Joseph's two dreams, the dreams of the butler and bakers, Pharaoh's two dreams. But these are connected with the idea of a mirror, right? A mirror is a doubling, isn't it? But where would we put the first doubling, at least the first one I can think of in Scripture, that we have something of a doubling? What about Lamech? Is Lamech a doubling? It looked to be a type of doubling. Okay, and it's, it's a pretty important doubling, right? Because Lamech, there's two of them. There's one, the descendant of Cain. And there's one, the descendant of Seth, right? Uh, you also have the 
Enox, I think that would be before that. Yeah, okay. Two Enox, are they spelt the same? Um, I believe so. So I mm-hmm. think you have Enoch. Is he the son or grandson of Cain? Okay. I think he, there's a, he goes and builds a city and names it after his son Enoch. Right. Yeah, I'm trying to. So we, we have Enoch there, and, and that would be important as a doubling as well, if, if that's the first one. Yeah, so Cain knew his wife conceived bare son Enoch. And so he's going to be the first Enoch. So both in, in there we have Enoch's and Lamech's. Now what's the, con- what's the connection between Enoch and Lamech? So those are in Genesis 4 and Genesis 5 that we're going to have Enoch and then Lamech. Right, so you're going to have this Enoch. He's going to have a son, Mahujal, and Methuselah. Right, so that's actually kind of another Methuselah, but it's a little bit different. And this, and he's going to beget beget Lamech. So you're going to well, Enoch has Arad, and Arad begat Mahujalal, and Mahujalal begat Methuselah, and Methuselah begat Lamech. So that's how many generations Enoch. So that's one, two, three. Four generations from the Enoch, who's a descendant of Cain. So that's the Lamech who's going to have the seven times curse if on anybody who would avenge him, I believe accidentally killing someone, causing what we would call uh, manslaughter. Right? So to be avenged of that. Now Cain did murder and killing Abel, and he was anybody who would pun- uh, try to avenge him would be um, punished seven times. But Lamech says, well, if Cain is has a seven times curse. I want a 70 times 70 curse for anybody who tries to avenge uh, the person that I killed accidentally. Right? That's the idea there. Okay. So we got, uh, so what are these doublings meaning then? When we have Cain, descendants of Cain with an Enoch and a Lamech, and we have descendants of Seth with uh, an Enoch and a Lamech. And with Enoch, you're going to have, like, the descendant of Seth, you're going to have Enoch, Methuselah, and then uh, Methuselah's going to um, have uh, Lamech. So what's the connection there? We have 65 years when Enoch has um, Methuselah, and then 187 years. Then Methuselah is going to be that age when he has Lamech. And then Lamech lives 777 years. Yeah, so you have a 252 there as well when Lamech is born. Yeah, so 252, that's 65 plus 187, right? So we can take these doublings that they're related to prophecy, to prophetic periods, just in the simplest sense, right? Because we have both Lamechs are connected to the 70 weeks as well. Right, the 70 times 7 and 777. And um, so these doublings are important. Now, you know, if we take Hophni and Phinehas's names, I mean, they're priests of the Lord, but they're obviously not really good guys, right? As we'll find out. And if you think of maybe the, the pugilist there example and the mouth of a serpent, uh, if you put those together, what do they represent? Well, they represent our adversary, right? And Hannah's going to have an adversary as well, right? <clears throat> okay, so let's go on and read a bit more. Okay, so here we're going to read some uh, Ellen White wrote from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 569. Elkanah, a Levite of Mount Ephraim, was a man of wealth and influence, and one who loved and feared the Lord. His wife Hannah was a woman of fervent piety, Gentle and unassuming, her character was marked with deep earnestness and a lofty faith. The blessing so earnestly sought by every Hebrew was denied this godly pair. Their home was not gladdened by the voice of childhood. The desire to perpetuate his name led the husband, as he had as it had led many others, to contract a second marriage. But this step, prompted by lack of faith in God, did not bring happiness. Sons and daughters were added to the household, but the joy and beauty of God's sacred institution had been marred, and the peace of the family was broken. Penina, the new wife, was jealous and narrow-minded, and she bore herself with pride and insolence. To Hannah, hope seemed crushed, 
and life a weary burden. Yet she met the trial of uncomplaining meekness. Okana faithfully observed the ordinances of God. The worship at Shiloh was still maintained, but on account of irregularities in the ministration, his services were not required at the sanctuary, to which, being a Levite, he was to give attendance. Yet he went up with his family to worship and sacrifice at the appointed gatherings. So that would imply that not just once a year. So these are the cross-references. Three times shalt thou keep a, a feast unto me in the year. So three times a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord. So it's three times, um, which he shall ch choose. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Right, so they have to bring an offering. And then it says, Luke 2, verse 41, now his parents, parents of Jesus, went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And Deuteronomy 12, verse 5, but unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither shalt thou come. So that's dealing with Shiloh and uh, where they have these offerings, the sanctuary. Okay. And, and it talks about in Joshua 18, verse 1, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there and the land was subdued before them, All right? So any thoughts on any of that? Okay, so when and when the time that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters portions, but unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. The Lord had shut up her womb. So she received a double portion. That's the idea of a worthy portion. But unto Hannah, Hannah, he gave a double portion. So again, we have a symbol attached there to the second angel's message, a double. Okay, what about the shutting up of her womb? You mean that she's unfruitful? Yeah, so she's not fruitful, right? But she has the double portion. So is it backwards? What do you mean backwards? When the oldest son would inherit the father's estate he received the blessing mm -hmm. he became the priest mm -hmm. and he received a double portion of the father's wealth yeah so here she receives the double portion samuel comes and is the blessing that she seeks yeah and he becomes a priest right so it's it's kind of backwards, you're saying. Right. Okay, so you got uh, the priest. So the person becomes a priest. So you have priest blessing, double portion, and you're saying that this is double portion, blessing priest. Correct. So like a mirror. Correct. Okay. Okay, so that's interesting as well. So So we look at this story. We can see that there's... There's symbolism here. There's typology that this history is illustrating something. Now, the thing about God's word is we know that it, it's um, uh, it, it can be seen on different levels, right? So we have been applying these when we study this to our history, right? That's that's the main way that we've been looking at this. But we can see it also applies to symbolically to the history of Israel itself, right? The, all of these stories, they, they keep repeating. And so in this story... In the SDA, church itself. Yeah. Okay. The yeah. Conference so, church. church. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's going to take a lot of thought to put, put this all together. Um, and it's going to take the Holy Spirit to show us some things. But we can see some of these pieces already. We just don't know where they all fit. We just know that this is is dealing with this the second angel's message. But in this situation as well, yeah, with Elkanah faithfully observing the ordinance of God, but having married two women, which is out of the order of God. Right. So there's a lack of faith on his part. Um, but in spite of that, God is going to 
use it as a blessing, which is sort of the way that God works, right? He he takes the weak things of the world to confound the wise, right? He he is ultimately honored even in our dishonor, to so to speak, right? Even in our not honoring him. And and that's because he loves us, right? Now, now here in this case of Hannah, I mean, she's faithful. She's not the one that's irritating. She's her, her uh, what do you ever call the other wife, is her adversary. And her adversary also provoked, provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb, right? So we have the Hebrew means angered her, but I, I think it's more in the sense of frustrated, right? She's extremely frustrated. But in this in this situation, yeah. Elkanah is instructed that he is to go up to the tabernacle to worship three times a year. Yeah. Is that a representation of the three angels' message? Yeah, well, I think so. I mean, I've, I've understood that in the past. So we got three angels' messages, and and they represent also – History. So one of the things we know is we have these three angels' messages, um, and and we first notice them, of course, in the right history. That's the template that we. But when we look at every other story, we see these these three repeated, right, in every story. That is, in every story, God's dealings with men are ever the same, and uh, so we see. Uh, the everlasting gospel being presented. And the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. So we see that in Millerite history. And because of that, because of Millerite history and how defined it is, I mean, it's the way marks in Millerite history become very well defined, especially as this movement has, has studied Millerite history. We see this pattern again and again throughout these stories. But the, but the symbols are there um, of these, you know, three times in a year that you go up to worship the Lord. So that re represents these three messages. So when we end up drawing this on a line, you know, one is we know that there's often multiple lines or a way to look at it is you have a bigger line. And as you look at each way mark, that there is a line within that way mark. We can just keep zooming in like a fractal and, and you see the same structure again and again. So there can be a line uh, that's a bigger line that we're going to be looking at. But this is this story itself is a line and, and it's illustrating something. So one of the things that we found when we when we went through these verses is that God would lead us to see. That, that that these beginning of these books, like when we looked at Judges and we got to Judges chapter two, we could see that it illustrate, illustrated the history of this movement from 9-11 until 2023, the time that we were um, just at that time coming to, right? So it was before 2023 is 2022. Uh, but we had a date in 2023 that was, we believe that would be a false prediction and it proved to be false Colin had made right so um so I expect that there's something here that that we're going to see that's going to illustrate our history now we haven't done any analysis of any of these numbers yet and I'm just checking something here okay so when we think about this year by year what's the significance of that for this movement well in this would the Hebrew say this as he did so time by time? They, uh, no, just uh, year by year. Okay. Right. So uh, um, so literally, if we look at the Hebrew, you know, because Shana is year. I'm just seeing here what, what, what words they use. Yeah, so they just use Shana, but in Hebrew, check it out. Yeah, it's just... Uh, yeah, so the, literally in Hebrew, it's Shana Bashana. Okay. So it just means year 
and and bat the bet at the beginning of shana is like the word in so instead of year by year as they translate it if you were going to be really literal it'd be year in year you know which wouldn't make sense in english right because right. but uh does that make sense so it's it's year by year so year in year that's the expression shana shana ba shana but the significance of that is it's it's an anniversary and we we always end up with these anniversaries in our um in our structures right so that is dates have symbols so we got to keep that in mind okay so our time is up and any final thoughts so it's it's going to take some time to get into this again studying like this on these verses I mean, I've, I've looked at this a bit every time. There's just so much information here. It's like, what do we look at next? But um, but we can see, you know, we have this adversary provoking her. Yeah. Probably sooner, sooner or later, it'd probably be developed on a line later on, probably. Yeah, we're going to draw it on a line. But right now, I'm not really sure how I would draw it on a line. Like, I don't. Yeah, um, that's what I said later, later on. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but, you know, we'll go through these, some of these symbols. And we'll probably have to go over it again, right? We'll go over the. Um, and normally, when we we draw it on a line, we have something that gives us a span of time, right? So Hebrew numbers, you know, they they can represent periods of time. Names also uh, can uh, give us symbolism that relates to time. Just the gematria of a name, right, can give us a number that sometimes relates to a symbol or a way more, or sometimes to a span of time. So, so it's going to take time to figure this out. Okay. Uh, so uh, Iran just gave us another uh, symbol here. So first Sam, Samuel 1 verse 5. It's, so it's verse number 7,218 in the Bible, what you're saying. Okay, so so that means we have the symbol there, all the numbers of 18720, it's July 18, 2020. Just like Lamech, if you take the letters of Lamech as gematria, you multiply them, you get 18720. So it's a symbol there. Now it's relating to this double portion and also to the shutting up of her womb, which we still need to address in more detail what that means. But this 15, wouldn't that also potentially be the first five of the virgins the wise five could be it's also yeah it could be that it could be the first day of the fifth month right which is the midnight cry so but yeah so we we need a structure in order to interpret these symbols we need a structure to place everything and we know before everything would fall into place we would examine all the pieces of the puzzle so we think about this as like, you know, when you're going to put together a puzzle, you know, you take the pieces, you set them up, you put, you know, the ones that are a similar color together. Now, sometimes people have put, you know, pieces from another puzzle get mixed in with your puzzle. And so when you're putting a puzzle together, sometimes it takes a little bit to figure out this piece doesn't belong. You know, it fit together here, but it doesn't belong. Or... Sometimes we end up putting pieces together that shouldn't be put together. And later on, we realize, oh, this piece didn't really fit here. It goes over here. Right. So so it takes time to sort through these pieces of the puzzle. But right now we're just examining the pieces of the puzzle to see where they're going to fit. That That's the analogy I like. It's, it's sort of I hate I hate puzzles, actually. I like I like mental puzzles, but not uh, physical puzzles. Uh, one is I want to get them all solved right away. But in this case, you know, we have to be patient and God's going to show us things, things about ourselves and things about our movement and things about the past and things about the present, and things about the future. And there will be a purpose in it. Right? That's that's how we approach God when we study this way. OK, well, let's close with prayer. The dear father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have had here again this morning. And I pray that you can bless each person. Bring us together again to study your word and continue to guide us in our personal study as we contemplate these things, as we seek to get to know you. Forgive us for our sins and help us to trust in your righteousness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.